Hi there, my name is Ben Coyman. I'm a learning advisor with ANU's academic skills team. And the two videos that I'm going to take you through today look at using sources and delivering presentations in order to set you up for your two major assignments as part of Art History 8022. So in this first video, we're going to talk about the importance of using sources, choosing and using the right sources, and how to incorporate sources into your writing through quoting, referencing, and paraphrasing. And then, in the second video, we'll talk about the keys to a good oral presentation. While the content of your assignments will be dictated primarily by your visual analysis, research plays a really important role in undertaking that analysis and writing it up. Research will provide you with important background about the artwork, which could be historical or cultural, it may relate to an aesthetic movement or trends. It may be a source of biographical information about the artist or information about their beliefs and styles. And it might also illuminate methods of production used in creating the artwork. In addition, research will help to strengthen and support your analysis through providing supporting evidence and examples and enable you to argue about your artwork from a position of authority. Let's say, for example, you chose to undertake a visual analysis of Jackson Pollock's Blue Poles, the wonderful artwork currently housed at the National Gallery of Australia. In terms of research you might undertake on Blue Poles, there are a number of different sources you could consult. These include art history books, book-length studies of the artist or the era and movement in which he operated, biographies of the artist, films and documentaries about the subject, book chapters that have been written about the artist or the artwork, and journal articles on the subject as well. So you have quite a wide range of sources at your disposal for this established artist. However, you may be choosing to focus on a more recent artwork, and I've chosen here a photograph by local artist Hannah Axelson titled Around Bellowan. Now, obviously, if you're looking to focus on a current working artist and a relatively recent artwork, there won't be such a big body of literature available for you to draw from. However, that's not to say that there isn't literature and sources out there that you can use in order to support your assignment. You could look at artist websites, blogs and Instagram accounts, and here you'll see Hannah Axelson does have her own website. You could consult contemporary art magazines and newsletters and news and promotional articles about the artist and or their artwork. You might consult profiles and interviews with the artist. If you found the work in a gallery, then you might consult any available exhibition or gallery notes or catalogues. They may well be students themselves who've written a thesis or exegesis about their artwork. And in cases where there isn't really much literature available for emerging artists, you might still be able to get insights by investigating their contemporaries, precursors, influences, similar artworks, and so on. So there is always literature out there that you can consult. Quite often it can be daunting to sift through all the literature and even decide which literature is most useful for you to read. And it's really good in this sort of situation to apply the 4S system, and this is a system to help maximize our reading. The first S stands for search, which means you do a quick search of how the text is laid out, what the different sections are, and so on. Secondly, you skim for key information, which would be contained, for instance, in a journal article, in the abstract, introduction, headings and subheadings, topic sentences, keywords, and so on. Once you've done searching and skimming, you're in a position to decide whether the text is worth reading or not. And if you decide it's not worth reading, then put it aside. But if it is worth reading, decide which sections or paragraphs will be most relevant to you. And at that point, what you want to do is study those carefully. Closely read them, take notes, and think about how that information can be worked into your assignments. There are many types of note-taking. Uh, here is just one example. As you can see, we have a page, a printed page. On the left-hand side of the page, you'll see the student has made notes about different ideas, points, theories, and so on. 
Meanwhile, on the right-hand side of the page, they've made that their queue column, where they make comments, note things they need to follow up, and so on. And at the bottom of the page, you'll see they've made a summary of the key information from that page, and that's a really useful thing to do while you're reading. And you'll also notice some highlights on the page as well. There is a risk, though, when it comes to highlighting that we highlight too much, to the point where very little of the page is left unhighlighted, and that's not really constructive, because then we can't easily pull out the key information. So a really good way of approaching reading is to read a whole page, and then when you figure out what is most important from that page, highlight that afterwards, rather than highlighting as you go, because when you're reading something for the first time, it all seems pretty important. And there are other note-taking strategies you can use. Many people just like to make dot points and, you know, bullet points on a page. Some people like to use mind mapping, as you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. Think about what will work best for you in terms of organizing your thoughts and ideas about the readings and about your subject. Now, once you've finished doing all of that research, it's time to start working it into the fabric of your assignments. And in a written assignment, this is done through what we call teal paragraphing. We've used a picture of a hamburger here because the shape of the hamburger resembles the shape of a paragraph. The top bun is the equivalent to a topic sentence. That's where you state the theme, idea, or argument of the paragraph. The middle of the hamburger, the meat or tofu if you're that way inclined, the gherkins, the tomato, the cheese, the lettuce, the onion, and so on, that relates to the middle of the paragraph, your explanation, evidence, and examples. This is a content that supports the main theme or idea of the paragraph and elaborates on it. And finally, at the bottom of the hamburger, we have the bottom bun and everything rests on that. And similarly, at the bottom of the paragraph, you have a linking sentence, which either links back to the main topic or sets up the next paragraph and provides a segue to it. Here we have a sample paragraph. What I'll ask you to do now is pause the video for a minute, read the sample paragraph, and then unpause and we'll discuss it in a bit more detail. Okay, so I've highlighted a few things over the next few slides. Here you can see that the red highlights the topic sentence and the concluding sentence. So this first sentence, blue poles cannot be interpreted through the lens of standard pictorial representation, is the topic sentence. That sets up the content of the paragraph and everything in the paragraph advances and supports that topic. In turn, that topic sentence feeds and advances the overall thesis or argument of your essay. Then when we get to the bottom of the paragraph, we have the linking sentence. Ultimately, Pollock subscribed to his aesthetic school of abstract expressionism as reflected in his technique. Hence, this is the best way to approach blue poles. And you can see that that's effectively wrapping up the theme of the paragraph and paving the way for the next one. And in green, we've highlighted where evidence has been incorporated from other sources in order to help explore the theme established in the topic sentence. So we have a quote about Pollock externalizing his seemingly troubled internal states. That comes from another source. We have information about the paints that were used to create blue poles, oil, enamel, and aluminium. And finally, we have information about the aesthetic school that Pollock subscribed to, namely abstract expressionism. Now, some of these things you may already know about blue poles, and you may already know about the artist or artwork that you're examining, but it is also important to reference information where you can to help support your observations. And you'll notice at the end of these pieces of information, little footnotes, which point the reader to the sources of this information. This is basically how we tell the reader that this information comes from other sources. And that's important for you to do not only to point the reader to the original source of information, but to help the reader distinguish between your observations and impressions of the artwork and those bits of information provided by other people. And through that, the reader can see how you're incorporating research in order to support your analysis. And this is what the Chicago notes would look like at the bottom of the page. And if you need help with your Chicago referencing, we recommend using the Monash University 
referencing and citing website. And I'll also just highlight here that when you quote a source, you want to put the quote in quotation marks. And ideally, if you can, it's really important to introduce the person speaking as well, because it can be quite jarring when the reader switches from your words to someone else's without any setup. There are a number of different ways that you can incorporate someone else's voice and quote into your writing. Use phrases like according to, as noted by, uh, the author comments, states, highlights, believes, observes, argues, and so on. And on top of that, there are other linking and transitional words that you can use in your paragraphing. Words to add information, such as in addition and furthermore, to express similarities, such as likewise, similarly, to express difference, such as however, in contrast, to show cause and effect, such as therefore, consequently, as a result, to introduce examples, such as for instance, for example, and to wrap a discussion, such as in conclusion, to conclude, finally, ultimately, etc. Think of these words as the glue that holds a paragraph together, or as traffic lights that tells the reader when they need to stop, slow down, turn right, turn left, and so on. While it is good to quote, you really shouldn't overquote. Paraphrasing is how we demonstrate to the reader that we've understood the content. Anybody can quote another author, but if you are able to paraphrase another author's words and ideas, that demonstrates your understanding of the concepts being discussed. A good paraphrase needs to do the following things. It sh should use different words to the source. It should use a different sentence structure or order. It should reduce the word count where possible. You don't want a paraphrase to be as long or longer than the original. Obviously, it needs to reference the original source. Even if it is you paraphrasing, it's still someone else's idea or information being paraphrased. And a good thing to do is to focus on the message of a source rather than how it's expressed. If we get too bogged down trying to paraphrase word by word at the sentence level, then we'll often end up with something very close to the source or somewhat or, or something that's a little bit more awkward. It's much better to paraphrase from your own notes rather than paraphrasing from the original first hand. Let's do a short activity. Have a look at the quote below, which comes from Hannah Axelson's website, and have a go at paraphrasing it. Pause the video while you're doing this, and then unpause once you've written the paraphrase. Okay, I hope you haven't been naughty and not paraphrased. What we're going to do now is compare the original to a couple of paraphrasing examples. And here we have an example of a poor paraphrase. Take a moment to read this. Okay, so this would be considered a fairly poor paraphrase of the original source. The reason for that is that it errs very closely to the structure of the original, it hits exactly the same beats, and it changes some words here and there, but ultimately does not really demonstrate that the student understood the source that they were paraphrasing. In comparison, this is a much more succinct and successful paraphrase. You'll notice that it's shorter than the original. You'll notice that it references the original as well, which the other one did not. And it essentially provides a snapshot of Axelson's message. So this is something that we want to strive for in our own paraphrasing. Don't just try to imitate the structure of the original and change a few words here and there. Instead, you should read the original, digest its key points, and then reproduce those key points using your own phrasing and your own words. Obviously, there will be certain terms and vocabulary that you need to use for the sake of clarity, but in general, strive to make your paraphrases shorter, more concise. And the paraphrase that we just looked at was built from notes. So as you can see in this table, we started with the original text. From that original text, the student made a few key notes, and those key notes became the basis of the paraphrase. So again, rather than working from the original when you're paraphrasing, it's a really good idea to take some notes 
and use those notes as the basis of your paraphrase. I hope this information was useful to you guys. Our next video will pick up where we left off and talk a little bit about oral presentations. Thanks for listening and I'll see you there.